Praise be Jesus Christ, dear brothers and sisters. Welcome to a live edition of Hope in the Desert. We are joined today by my producer and co-host, Joseph Gallagher, as well as Father James Altman. Father Altman, Joseph, Greetings. welcome Greetings. to Hope in the Desert. Glad to be here. I think this is my first appearance. Second appearance, Father. Second it's appearance. Okay. <laughs> the first one was so memorable. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> It was a few months ago. You're a busy man, a very, very busy man. But why don't we begin with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. O most sacred heart of Jesus. Have mercy on us. O immaculate heart of Mary. Pray for us. St. John the Baptist. Pray for us. And St. Joseph, terror of demons. Pray for us. Father, you were just in Los Angeles on Friday at the prayer rally in yes, protest of the so-called so -called Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, also known as the Sisters of Perpetual Devancy. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your time there at Dodger Stadium. Sure. So uh, I like to think of them as a freak show. Uh, and that's, you know what? I never miss words. A freak show is a freak show. We call it for what it is. These men, dressing a butch, by the way, sacred scripture specifically tells us, is an abomination in the eyes of God, just dressing as a woman. Uh, let's make matters worse. Let's have them dress up as sisters, like nuns, and then do lewd and lascivious things with like crucifixes. These SOBs, can I be more clear? I, I mean, if you need me to be more clear, I'd be happy to be more clear about these deviant freaks. And yet these are the people that the Dodgers, their organization decides to honor. Hey, try, pull that stunt with the Muslim, you're gonna get your head chopped off. You pull that stunt with the Catholic church, we got a pansy bunch of wimps bishops who won't say anything. Uh, so there we go. That sets the stage for the insanity that was taking place out at Dodger Stadium. That, by the way, I've been a Dodger St Dodgers fan since I was in eighth grade. So that's 52 years ago. No more. Until they give a public apology to all Christianity and specifically to the Catholics. Done. Absolutely done. Everybody, turn off the Dodger game. Turn off Major League Baseball until they apologize. Major League Baseball, you're responsible because you let the Dodgers get away with that nonsense. How dare and Father, you? Father, if I could just add in, I mean, you and I have had several conversations. You are a huge sports fan. Probably hockey is your favorite sport, if I was to guess by how much you talk about hockey it. Hockey and baseball. Hockey and baseball, tennis. I but the NHL, the NHL was doing the same thing. The NHL was promoting pride, and they stopped because some of their players said, please, you're going to get us in trouble in our home country. Right. And fortunately, they relented. But why do you think the bishops of California took a step back? I mean, those are those their words. They said, we're taking a step back. And we're not saying them are pansies anyway. Get this straight. They're all a bunch of pansies. That's why. They are, they are definitely pansies. But we did have one bishop there, Bishop Joseph Strickland of Tyler, Texas. Exactly. Can you tell us, did you have a conversation with Bishop Strickland? I only saw the rosary rally that he led. It looked yeah. very powerful to have him leading the group towards oh, yeah. Dodger Stadium. Yeah. And he had he was carrying the relic, the first class relic of Pope St. John Paul II, who in, in the, the brochure, the flyer that went out uh, with regard to uh, this whole event, uh, said it was so beautifully done. It says uh, Pope St. John Paul II returns to the Dodger Stadium, right? Because he was there the first time he actually was there uh, when he made a visit to the United States. And so he was returning in repudiation of everything that was happening that night, in repudiation of the filthy loser bishops. And and there's a cardinal out there, right? McElroy, get this. Yeah. 
McElroy, even now, you can fact check me on this. I think it's going to come out. And even now, he's working with the AUSCP, right? Is that what it's called? Uh, yep. Association of United States Catholic Priests. What it should say is, and it should say AUSHH for American, let's see, Association of United States Homosexual Heretics. That's what it should say. And McElroy's work with them in Watch. There's talk that he wants to start having gay parishes, specifically, openly, notoriously. Yeah, wait till it all comes out. You just well, Father, you bring up a good point. They're meeting this week in San Diego, the uh, Association of uh, U.S. Catholic Priests. Yeah. Not only is McElroy supporting them, but several bishops are. Uh, several these, bishops are. Exactly. They're having. They're having open homosexuals speaking. And when I say open homosexuals, meaning that they're in a relationship that they try to call marriage. Obviously, we know that a marriage is only between one man and one woman. Yeah. Uh, but they're they're in these civil unions and they're promoting this. And they have the bishops there. While this week coming up, in just a few days, we're going to have a House United in Rosemont. Father Altman, you're one of our speakers. Yeah. Okay. Not one bishop is going to be there in support of canceled priests. No. What, what do you make of this? Exactly. Not one bishop in support of canceled priests, but they're all out there in San Diego with Cardinal McElroy in support of absolute abomination in God's eyes. I mean, are we clear on this? Is there any Catholic or any Christian who disputes this? Listen, there's a bunch of people who call themselves Catholic and a bunch of people who call themselves Christians who are fakes, frauds, imposters. And we'll answer for it on damnation day, on judgment day, for their heresy, for their apostasy, for their absolutely misleading any other Christians in the truth of what almighty God creator of male and female, of what he has taught and handed down to us. Uh, it is an abomination what these people are doing. And, and McElroy can go to hell and the sooner the better before he leads other uh, souls into damnation with him. And so goes for any other bishop. Look at John Stowe. You re, I mean, do you remember, uh, maybe you didn't know this, but it wasn't too long ago, sometime within the last month, where John Stowe hires as his director of sacred liturgy, you can imagine how, how sacred that liturgy is not going to be, as director of sacred liturgy, one of McElroy's boys out from San Diego, who's openly married, married, such as it is, to another man, and dares to say, nobody's going to deny me the Holy Eucharist. Fact check me on it. I believe that's a quote or darn close to it. Uh, and there's John Stowe flying the rainbow flag for pride, one of the seven deadly sins above his cathedral for the month of June. And he hires this openly, notori notoriously partnered up gay man as his director of sacred liturgy. Now, see, I did not know that. In fact, Joe, if you could fact check that for us. Uh, not necessarily right now, but, you know, you know we, we need to get pictures up if he's flying the rainbow flag over the Lexington. Yeah, he's East. been doing that for years. Uh, they, wow, Stowe. this is news to me. Oh, uh, no, Stowe's been doing that for years. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's he's, he's the same guy, by the way, that ripped into Nick Sandman as being a racist. That 16 year old yeah. boy who made the pilgrimage to Washington, D.C. Listen, I hope I, I hope one day I have few people that I think are my heroes. And I hope one day I get to shake Nick Sandman's hand. I met his parents, phenomenal parents, that put up with hell that this left-wing, damned communist left-wing media put them through hell. And they can all burn in hell. And, you know, it was sad because Nick Sandman was from the Covington Diocese and his own bishop threw him under the bus. Well, and Nick Sandman had to, sue, had to sue the Diocese of Covington in order to get the bishop to apologize. And ladies no, and gentlemen, I just want to let you know, this is one of the reasons why the coalition takes so seriously that priests not only have good canon lawyers, but if need be, have good attorneys. Because the only way you're going to get the bishops to move to actually do what is right is if they are facing a major lawsuit. This is what it's come down to. Yes, there are a few exceptions, Bishop Strickland being one of them. All right. But the majority of bishops or would be completely fine with the Association of U.S. Catholic Priests having a conference 
in their diocese, welcoming priests that are open heretics, welcoming other bishops that are going against church teaching. And we have to realize that the only way that this is going to stop is if we stand up and say, no more. We're going to unite. We're going to be a united front as Catholics and not allow this to happen. And I was overjoyed. How many people would you say were there, Father Altman? About 5,000? Yeah. You know, they, they actually wondered if they were going to get 500. And it ended up being about 5,000. And it was it was like a sea of faithful people. Not just Catholics either, by the way. This was an affront to all Christianity. And, and there was like about 5,000 people. It was amazing. Absolutely amazing. The prayerfulness and peacefulness. I heard that, you know, I'd heard in advance that Antifa wanted to maybe stir up some trouble. Because they always do. The loser, filthy communists that they are like Hitler's brown shirts or the KGB under Stalin. I mean, this is as filthy left-wing communist back Antifa organization, nothing but troublemakers. You know, uh, it's time we stood up against them too. The, uh, anyway, about a hundred of them, I guess, showed up, took a look around, thought, nope, not going to not stay in. And then they left. The police were oh, there. That's, that's what you have to do. You have to stand up to Antifa. I mean, Joe, you've stood up to Antifa, have you not? I think I've seen videos of you standing pretty much eye to eye with Antifa protesters at other events. Uh, what else can you do as a man but stand up and, and, and face down evil? Yeah, I think um, it's an interesting question. This is a question that I wanted to, uh, you know, just bring up to uh, both of you fathers, uh, just as, you know, as we have the conversation about everything that happened in Los Angeles. But when I had my big moment confronting, uh, being confronted by engaging with uh, members of Antifa, uh, I had a really big moment, an eye opening moment. And it, it was this notion that, yeah, um, the majority of the bishops are garbage or Joe Biden is peddling very macabre lifestyles. Uh, children are being ripped limb from limb. These indoctrinated young men and women are peddling it. And what helped me look at those people, I mean, face to face, I think I was, it was on the cover of the Boston Herald uh, on their uh, website, was that those Antifa people, Jesus wants them saved too. So when I found myself surrounded with some other uh, young men too at the men's march uh, out there in Boston, I wasn't, I didn't have the mentality of I'm here to go to war or I'm here to fight with these guys. If I had to have defended myself, well, I would have tried to the best of my ability. But, you know, when it's, you know, three on 70, you don't really have much hope. But I was there standing in front of them because I realized that Jesus wants their souls saved, too. And I think that's the most important thing with all of this. As disgusting, insulting, blasphemous, sacrilegious uh, as it is to see the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, they all are called to salvation. Bishop Sheen talks about this notion that people have this spectrum of spiritual capability. The more capable a person is of evil, so too are they of good. So consider Hitler. Imagine if Hitler embraced the gospel. According to Fulton Sheen and some other scholars and theologians of the church, Hitler could have been even more impactful if he chose to be a man of the faith. And I think the same thing is here with all of these different people, all these different leaders in the church. And that's what makes it more terrifying to be in their shoes. When, you know, the majority of bishops and cardinals, the hierarchy of the church, they've got one foot in the grave and another on a banana peel. They're getting up there in age. And that's what makes it even more horrifying. You have so much potential to do good and so much potential to change the world and to save not only your soul, but those who are under your care or those who are around you and you choose not to. And well, that, not, only that, not, not only that, Joe, but to do it in Los Angeles, you know, we here, the three of us are in the Midwest and we often joke about the left coast and, you know, California is going to fall into the Pacific any moment, not because of some earthquake, 
but because of the sins that are going on out there. But here you are in a state that's probably the bluest of the blue states. Don't get me wrong, Illinois, New York, and Michigan are giving them a run for their money. But the bluest of the blue states, you have 5,000 people turn out. And yes, some probably came from out of state. Obviously, Father Altman and Bishop Strickland did. But you have 5,000 people turn out. What an incredible witness that is. Now, I heard, and Father, you might have been telling me this. Forgive me if uh, I'm repeating myself or repeating you. Uh, but that some people pulled up not realizing what was going on. And when they heard what you guys were doing there, protesting, they decided not to go to the game. Is that true? That I, that I don't know. Uh, I was off to this one side over there, and I spent over four hours just standing there talking to one person after another that wanted to uh, greet me and, and uh, be prayed with, uh, be blessed, to be supported in the truth of the faith. Uh, all saying the same thing that they've been saying since day one, Father, that the bishops abandoned them and they had no one to turn to during COVID lockdown because the bishops abandoned them. Uh, all saying the same thing. And so uh, I wouldn't be surprised that people pulled up and that didn't know. I don't know how anybody in this country uh, had. You'd have to be clueless to not know that there was this big brouhaha going on at the Dodgers game. But um, I'm glad to hear that others that had arrived on the scene not knowing what was going on chose not to attend at least at the beginning because when they did i don't know if you saw the pictures but when they did finally give this farce of an award an absolute farce um there were there was there was more cameramen and grounds crew in the stadium than there were the than there were like fans and a couple of them booed loudly when they got this award if I were one of those sisters, I'd have been so humiliated that here we're supposed to be getting an award. And not only does nobody, I mean, the, the stadium's empty, uh, but a handful that were there booed them. They have no shame because, well, obviously they don't have any shame or they wouldn't be doing what they're doing in the first place. Their hatred for Christianity and their hatred for God must be so great that they are immune to uh, common sense. And uh, I mean, that's ultimately what it becomes. They hate. They hate God because they're blaming him for who they are or what they have developed into is a better way to talk about it. And, and so their hatred for all Christianity, because it makes them feel less than, less than uh, good or perfect. Uh, the hatred for, for maleness, for masculinity is so great that they have to prance around in these ridiculous costumes. Uh, it's, it's all hatred that they have, that not realizing that the one thing that they're attacking, which is Christ himself, is divine love that, as Joe was saying, really wants to bring the, his love and healing into their lives. But they're rejecting it. And so I'm also realistic. Yeah, God wants us all saved. He wants everybody saved. But Jesus made it crystal clear that many versus few are going to choose hell, just as these people are choosing to be the abomination in God's eyes that they are. That's the scariest part. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I mean, that's really, they choose this. This yeah. isn't an accident. They don't just accidentally show up at the stadium wearing women's clothing as a nun on top of it all. Not just women's clothing, but as what in essence is a, a sacred symbol of those women who have given themselves to a life of holiness. And they are intentionally, knowing and intentionally, desecrating it that is how much they hate so they're choosing and you know what every time we make a choice we are more baked in clay in that choice and it is foolhardy utter foolishness as saint john Vianney, confessor you know patron saint of confessors and priests said deathbed conversions are rare the more you choose the more you bake yourself into a position that you will not get yourself out of so the, this hatred that they're spewing, it's, it's almost impossible to come back from it. But, there's, well, but not only that, it's their choice. Not only that, Father, but they're spinning this. They had a Los Angeles uh, councilwoman, alderman, whatever they call it out there in Los Angeles, uh, come out and praise them for continuing the tradition of Catholic sisters throughout the ages. They, I mean, they're trying to make it seem like 
this this group of perverts, as you call them, and rightly so. Freaks, freaks, I call them, but perverts. Oh, freaks. But yeah. either way, perverts, freaks, it doesn't matter. <laughs> they're one and the same. Yeah. Is that they're carrying on the Catholic tradition of helping others, when in reality, they're simply mocking the faith. What I don't want to say I was disappointed, but I got a reminder the next morning after the event when they panned, somebody panned the third inning of the game, and it was about 90% full. And so while many people stayed away from the award ceremony, they still showed up to go to the game. Right, right. You know, I mean, people have to start to realize that these corporations, whether it's beer, whether it's uh, major league sports, the only way you're going to get them to stop doing crazy, <laughs> bigoted things like this is by turning off their product. You know, if I was owning the Dodgers, I would go, we had almost a completely full stadium. Yeah, probably not completely full. We had some people turn away, but we'll make it up in the end. How do we, and I, and I want to ask this of both of you, a priest, a lawyer, a young man, and then also Joe Gallagher, I want to ask. Uh, hey, that, uh, was, that was actually uh, kind of funny. I didn't see okay, that. Yeah, that was pretty good. <laughs> and, but, 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 I, but I want to ask is, how, how do we move forward to get those that are lukewarm? Because remember, it's it's the lukewarm that's going to be spewed out of our Lord's mouth. It's going to be, there are going to be, he, he's, he, remember Christ said, I wish you were either hot or cold. Yeah. You know, these people are just lukewarm. They say, well, I might not agree with it, but I paid money for the tickets. And, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to stay focused on the baseball. Yeah. So the actual numbers were about 41,000 in attendance, and they were down 15,000 from what was a sold-out venue. Uh, they are always sold out. Uh, so 15,000 people at least didn't show up. And and so that's a significant number. That's what? That's 25%. Uh, you, to ultimately, like I did on that day, I said, that's it. I mean, the minute I learned about this until the Dodgers apologized publicly for the bigotry that they enabled, the, the shameful, uh, irreligious, sacrilegious attack and, on Catholics and Christians everywhere, until they publicly apologized for that, done, done with Major League Baseball, because they are the ones that, that could say, by the way, I did hear this, by the way, I did hear Major League Baseball said no more of this pride stuff. Right, we're, to, we're here to entertain the people by playing a game. This isn't a chance to have a political statement. We're here to play a game. Everybody in the entertainment industry, whether it be entertainment and sports or through TV or movies, better get it through their head that at best they are entertainers and they lose that entertainment value. The minute they stick their nose out where it doesn't belong as if they're intelligent and they're not, uh, to, to give political views. We're not interested in your political views. I'm going to see a movie or a TV show or a, a baseball game to be entertained, not, not be confronted by your political agenda. Uh, until we just shut them off, right? Just shut them off. Uh, they're going to continue doing this. But there are so many people, the majority of people, don't care. And so I'm, I don't hold out any false hope. I'm certainly not deluding myself into thinking that this is actually going to happen. But at least amongst us Christians, when we stand before our Lord God on our judgment day, we can say, I didn't enable this. I didn't participate in it. I didn't support it. And that's really the best at this point that we can do is simply cut off our own support. Not that they're going to go down in flames because they, they have so many godless, uh, weak uh lukewarm as you as you mentioned from i think that's in revelation uh lukewarm people that that will support them no matter what um but yeah it just stops stop supporting them i mean i don't i'm not my life is not going to be diminished in in joy and happiness by not watching a major league baseball game uh knowing what major league baseball is doing what the dodgers have done so no I, that's what that's all we ever can do and let, leave the rest to god this problem is so big now um uh, that only God is going to fix it. By the way, Hitler, when you, you had a, an interesting comment about Hitler earlier, where uh, said, I think it was Joe, you said that Hitler, look, imagine the good he could have done. Well, here's the problem. He was financed by the international, many American bankers, right? 
to pursue the agenda that he pursued. If he was a nice guy, he wouldn't have gotten a dime one. And Germany was actually the hardest hit of all countries under the Great Depression, because not only did their economy collapse, as did everybody else's, all orchestrated by these international bankers through the 1929 stock market crash and all that flowed from it. Uh, not only did Germany suffer like every other country, Germany also was subject to the Versailles Treaty, where they had to pay these reparations, which only made it all the more difficult for those people to, to manage life, just basic necessities. So along comes the American and international bankers that finance his rise to power. Well, they knew way back in 1933 that he was crazy, right? But they, but they supported it nonetheless. So many people are so ignorant of history, so ignorant of the facts of history. They don't get how Hitler rose to power in the first place. So, um, yeah, he could have done a lot of good, but then he never would have risen to power because they finance only those who, who are there. He's just a pawn in this whole chess game that they're playing for global dominion. And that's really, and that sounds like a conspiracy theory. You know what? They, they brag about it openly now. There's no conspiracy going on. They're doing it on purpose. And they're so bold about it now that they even brag about it publicly. So uh, most people, though, are just ignorant. There is some bread and circuses, isn't it? And baseball is just one of the circuses, one of the forms of entertainment. It's food and entertainment. As long as we get that, eh, anything goes. What can I do? Well, you can stand before God and say, well, what could I do? And God said, well, you know, I gave you two talents. You didn't produce an additional two. Or I gave you four and you didn't produce an additional four. What could you do? Well, you could have done as much as you could have do, but you didn't do anything. You were like that guy that buried the talent in the backyard, right? So the, everybody who says, well, what can I do? Throws up their arms. What can I do? Just remember the guy who buried his talent in the backyard burned in hell for eternity. So you better figure out what you can do. For your sake of your own eternal soul. And I hope that makes sense because it's actually true. You, you know, you I, an interesting point, Father, and as you well know, the coalition has been getting a lot of people complaining is not the right word, but hesitant to come to our conference this week in Rosemont because they, they associate it with Chicago. And I had a back and forth with a gentleman who was from Alabama and he basically stated, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't have the interchange in front of me right now, but he basically stated, because I said to him, you know, the apostles were not afraid to go to the ends of the earth to bring the good news of Jesus Christ. I mean, they went out to India, they went into the slums of Rome itself in order to bring Christ to others. Why can't you come and do that? And his response was, and I thought it was so telling of the state of the church today. He said, the apostles were called to be martyrs. I'm not called to be a martyr. I'm called to raise my children. And I think it's kind of that attitude is, well, I'm going to practice my faith to a point but they're not going to give their all. And they hide behind vocation. They hide behind um, many different things. But in the end, we have to realize we're all called to martyrdom, whether it's red martyrdom or white martyrdom. We're called to give day in and day out 100% of ourself for Christ. Now, how many of us actually do that day in and day out? Not many. Not many. And I always tell people, as you grow closer to our Lord, when you confess sins, it's a lot less sins of commission that you're confessing and a lot more sins of omission, things that we fail to do as Catholics. And so when we have events like this at Dodger Stadium, what does it say to us? What does it say when we see 5,000 people turn out instead of 500? That there is still hope that there are people that are craving the good news of our Lord, and we just have to go out and proclaim it. We don't have to be great at it. We don't have to have the five talents. We don't even have to have the two talents. We just have to take what the Lord has given us and be open to working through us. I don't mean to sound preachy, but it, it, it really, ladies and gentlemen, it comes down to that. If we give our all, we're going to be canceled. We are going to be crucified with our Lord. But that's the life that we're called to at baptism. 
Joe, so, father, tell me where I'm wrong. So, yeah, Joe, I don't want to hog your face. Can I just throw in one point, though? So you said 5,000 showed up. That meant there were quite a few other people. There's about 40 million people in California, isn't it? Some huge amount, 40 million, 35 million? 40 million, so, about 40 million. Yeah, so 5,000 showed up. And, and I'm sure, you know, I mean, it took, it was a very long hour at least to drive from where I was to, to the, to the stadium. And it was, I mean, it was arduous, but here's the thing. So people might say, well, I don't feel like putting in the effort to go. Right. So, but, but what preceded my hour drive on California highway up to that stadium was I had to start out, I had to fly to Appleton or drive to Appleton, which is an hour and a half away, fly to Minneapolis, fly to Atlanta, and fly to John Wayne International in Orange County Airport. And then, only then, after having arrived like 10 o'clock at night on Thursday, then Friday I had to get up and then make that additional one hour drive there, right? And then, and then there comes the way back. I had to drive the hour plus back to where I was staying in a family's home. And then I had to make another drive to the airport and fly to Minneapolis and fly back to Appleton and then drive another hour and a half back until I finally arrived at my front door. So I've had three arduous days of travel and presence. So if anybody out in California, some lukewarm person is sitting here listening and you chose not to go because it was a little arduous to drive an hour to that place and be part of the presence of 5,000 people. Well, shame on you. You know, and you can ex don't have to explain to me. When I stand before our Lord, he's, you look at this little set of days in my life and say, well, you gave it up your all. What more could I ask of you to do short of actual martyrdom? Um, martyrdom, white martyrdom takes a place of little sacrifices you make every day where you you're sacrificed in time and energy to do the right thing to be a witness of faith unto martyrdom red or white and and so many people would not do that and well it, it can answer to god for that because this was a moment we don't get many opportunities for this this was a moment in our lives where we could stand up and say professional sports we've had it with your politics We've had it with your not not your bigotry. We've had it like we had it with Bud Light, like we had it with Target, like we had it with what, I forget. There was some other place that, that just recently was doing that same stupid thing. We've had it. And we're not going to put up with your bigotry anymore. Well, 5000 people made a statement that day. What about the other ones that didn't come? You made a statement. All right. Yeah. Father, that 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 leads me to a, a question. Oh, hold on, real quick, Father. Love, love, love. Yeah, Joe, okay, go ahead. It's okay, You've guys. They're so yeah. quietly. <laughs> um, I just would like to say there's three million Catholics in the county of Orange alone in California. So five thousand, good number, very large. Could it have been much bigger? Yeah, yeah. I definitely should have. Yeah. I, I I agree with that. I, well, but, but the bishops weren't helping, were they? No, they made it worse. What's that? That guy? What's that guy? Oh, gosh, what's his name? Who's the, it begins with the letter H, maybe not. What's his name out there, the Archbishop? Gomez? Gomez. Gomez. Yeah. Gomez and his assistant, who is who is just another one of the boys' club. Uh, they said, oh, we're just going to pray. Yeah. Yeah, how about you stand up and speak up and condemn the bigotry? Condemn the bigotry. Gomez, you failed. You're an epic failure, Gomez. Turn in your mitre, Gomez. You're a failure. Take your prayer, your pathetic pansy prayer, and take a hike, Gomez. You're a failure. He failed every Catholic out there, every Catholic in the nation that was a, that was assaulted by the bigotry that the Dodgers allowed. Gomez, turn in your mitre. Yeah, that. That actually pansies. That actually leads into the question I was just about to ask. Father, other than you and Bishop Strickland, were there any other clergy there? Were there any priests, any deacons that you know of that showed up in support? Yeah. I did see a bishop from a different denomination. I, I, it looked like he's an Anglican. Um, 
he he showed up but i did not see one other priest present i there might have been i mean i did i didn't introduce myself to five thousand people uh but i mean i'm i'm looking around i don't see anybody in clerics or cassock so no, you you were pretty busy i talked with john henry weston this morning and I asked him if he had a conversation with you. And he said, I saw him across the parking lot. That's about as close as I got to Father Art Altman. That, that's um, about as close as he could. It was, it, I'm not I'm not joking when I say I stood there in one spot for over four hours, greeting one person after another, after another. And then when I tried to, when I tried, listen, I hadn't eaten since 10 a.m. You know my body is hypoglycemic. I need to, I'm supposed to eat every now and then it, and so they were trying to get me out of there to, to get something to eat and to, and to go home and rest. And and, uh, and even as I'm trying to make my way to the car, uh, the people were, Father, could, could you bless this for me? Father, could you pray for me? Could you? They knelt down on the parking lot and I was praying blessings over them. Families, all sizes, all people. Uh, it, was, it was absolutely amazing. And then at the very end, you, don't, you might not know this, Father or Joe, but at the very end, so as I'm probably the third to the last person. Somebody comes up, they hold a phone in front of my face. And, Father, would you just say something to the Latinos? And I thought, okay. I, so they recorded this. It couldn't have been 20 seconds. Well, all of a sudden it shows up on, his name is David Harris Jr. I think that's his name. One and a half million subscribers. And within two days, there were over 400, was it up to 415,000 views, I think? So that, that message, just by God's providence, as I'm getting ready to leave, suddenly it's not just the 5,000 that we're speaking to, but really to, to the faithful everywhere. Uh, but, but how many people listen in to uh, Gomez's little prayer? Nice prayer, Gomez. You did a bang-up job, Gomez. You really told the Dodgers, didn't you, Gomez? You really showed the Dodgers. So, so I see Joe smiling. <laughs> well, I mean, tell me that's not true. Uh, wow. <laughs> it is I'm true. I'm looking at your dog's expression right now as you're expressing that. <laughs> He's uh, used to being blowing up. I know. We, we got to get a camera on him uh, just for his expression. <laughs> Look at it. Yeah, there he goes off on a tangent again. <laughs> but, Father, I mean, to be serious, as you're leaving, did you notice any any sense of – counter demonstrations. We talked about not seeing Antifa. They didn't seem to show up. But was there any ambivalence towards the 5,000? Because it, it seemed like the the march from the parking lot to the entrance of the stadium was a little bit unplanned, that it would just spur of the moment they decided to march. Is that true? Yeah, so, so I'm not really, I'm out of the loop on that one. I did know that they were going to process. I thought I thought they were always going to process with the first class relic of Pope St. John Paul II. That I thought was going to happen. How it was going to happen, all the particulars, that much I did not know. And because I was stuck way over here on the left side, I didn't even get to hear the speakers. Because, you know, when you're talking to someone uh, who's seeking just affirmation in their faith and, and uh, that you're you're so focused on what they're saying that you don't you can't hear what's going on I heard voices I couldn't even distinguish between people's voices up there on the stage so I I pretty much saw nothing of the event apart from the the number of people as I was coming up and it, the mass it just kept getting bigger and bigger and uh, I know they took part in the procession. I heard they were taking part in the procession. I did hear them pray the rosary. I did hear them pray the, the mercy chaplet. Uh, so I did see that much. But I think the procession was, in fact, planned. And all I, the only person you asked about, like, pushback from other people present or something, it was a united, joyful, happy, glorious, faithful crowd uh, and and supportive of, of each other amongst several denominations that were there uh that i did hear is this is how stupid people are okay i'm just going to come right out and call it for what it is how stupid people can be there's one guy over there on this as they were processing up and processing back one guy some protestant of some denomination 
of which there are what 40 some thousand different denominations, 80 some thousand non-denominational all started by somebody who thinks their scholarship and wisdom is so grand as to exceed 2000 years of saints and martyrs. Go figure. There's one guy that was condemning the Catholics in the March. We're all going to hell because we worship Mary. I'm thinking you stupid moron. Get this. We got to call them up for who they are and what they are. There's that is culpable guilt for saying something so stupid as that. That was the only person. Listen, buddy, here, we're trying to support Christ's message that he is God. We are, he is, he is God. We are not. He's a creator. We are the created. He defines gender. We do not. You could, instead of trying to call us, call Catholics out for what you perceive in your scholarship is some sort of perhaps error. How about you join with us as a stronger, united voice on what we do agree upon, which is there's an abomination over there in the stadium, you moron. That was the only person I heard that actually caused any, like any, and what would you call it? You said uh, any counter demonstration or anything else. That was some dumb person claiming to be a Protestant ripping on Catholics on of all days. Here you have thousands and thousands of Catholics trying to uphold the truth of the faith and he got some idiot ripping into him. So no, that's the only thing. You know, and it's, it's it's very sad, Father, because not knowing what Protestant denomination that guy was, you and I last August had a wonderful meeting just outside of Baltimore. Yes. With a group of Catholic priests and Protestant ministers. Yes. Okay. And by the way, it was not ecumenism. Okay. Uh, we had frank discussions about the differences in our faith but the importance of standing up and realizing that we have to, at times, work together. And I'm sorry for some of the trads out there that are going to hear me say this, okay? I don't have to necessarily agree with certain Protestant statements, but I know that there's a lot of Protestants of goodwill that want to grow closer to Jesus and to have a conversation is the beginning of evangelization for them. And father, if you remember, you and I did not back down with them. You know, sometimes, sometimes when you get together with a group of Protestants, Catholics sometimes try to drop certain things that make us Catholic. We might start the prayer without the sign of the cross. We might not invoke Mary, but you and I were very clear on the importance of Mary in the lives of all Christians, not just Catholics, that we don't worship her, but you're always going to get a group, sad to say, that are always going to say, well, you just worship Mary. And you could go through point by point of how we don't. I know. But you're always going to have somebody out there basically saying, we're the problem. We're the problem, not what's going on at Dodger Stadium or in other places. Now, I will say this. We're the problem in the sense that we let it happen as a church. There was a time when stuff like this would not happen. There was a time just 60 years ago when the Archbishop of Los Angeles was told by the county of L.A. that they were going to discontinue busing to Catholic schools. And I think it was Cardinal Ritter, fact check me on that, basically said, no, no. You're going to continue doing busing. And I said, sorry, Your Eminence, we just simply can't afford it anymore. So he shut down all the Catholic schools in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, flooded the public school system with all these Catholic kids that needed to go to school. And they came begging to him to reopen the Catholic schools. And you know what he said? Because they said, we'll give you the busing. We're sorry. Here's the busing. You know what the Cardinal Archbishop of L.A. said then? I want milk for all my students, too, and I want you to pay for it. Because it's my taxpayers that go to my church that are paying for the milk already. Give us the milk, too. And that's what they did. But now they don't do that anymore. Now they talk about stepping back. Yeah. We're going to reevaluate. Where do you think Archbishop Gomez and his auxiliaries, I can't remember if he has one or two. Or I can't remember how many. He's got a couple. How, how, where do you think they would have been if that was an anti-immigration or if that was a pro-illegal immigration, excuse me, rally? 
they would have been up there in the front lines leading the procession. 100%. See, there you go, Father. You hit the nail on the head right there. They would have been right there for their little social justice warrior things. And now they say, well, we can't be political. Well, baloney. They're very political when it suits their left-wing communist agenda, their globalist agenda. When it suits Jorge Bergoglio's agenda, oh, they're right there on the front lines. McElroy is 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 as evil as they come. He's right there on the front lines trying to get these illegals in. Meanwhile, meanwhile, we have poor people in this country that we're not helping. But let's just, you know, whole bunch of more illegals in that that we now somehow have to support when we can't even support the ones we have. The, so no, you're right. You're absolutely right, Father. That the. the Gomez and his assistants, his auxiliaries out there would have been. Uh, well, do you remember? Do you remember when Cardinal Gregory, uh, when Black Lives Matter, a communist organization, a godless, damned, anti-American organization, when they were per, per, you know, they were having some sort of uh, protest parade down in in D.C. and he told his priests to dress in black and go join them, right? Get, oh, they'll jump right on board for every godless, damned uh, SJW agenda item on the Democrat Party platform. Oh, they'll jump right on board for that. But but for something like this, absolute bigotry against the Catholic Church and every Christian church? Oh, no. No, let's just sit back in our little room and pray. Yeah. Father, I, I have to ask you, and I, I'm asking this on behalf of Joe Gallagher. I'm asking this on behalf of everyone that's listening. At what point as... Good, good Catholics are trying to be good Catholics and trying to be good Americans. When, when does civil disobedience kick in? When, when do we start saying enough's enough to the bishops and start telling them, start acting like fathers because you're not acting like fathers now? I mean, what kind of example as clergy are, are we allowing as priests when the bishops are, to use your own word, so feckless? In, in the side of this, okay? And and I want to make something very clear to everybody that's watching, okay? And for those that might say, well, fathers, you got to watch your tone, you know, they are the successors of the apostles and the Holy Ghost appointed them, okay? Let's get a couple of things straight. They are, they are called to that office, yes. But you're not going to tell me that the Holy Ghost doesn't want them to be the best bishops that they can be, leading their flocks as a father, okay? They are... Guilty, almost all of them, not all of them, but almost all of them, of the worst type of crime that you can commit against a child, us, the spiritual children. And that's neglect. That's absolute neglect. They have forfeited their role as pastors and shepherds of leading us to Christ in order to cooperate with evil. And if you don't think that cooperating with some of these state governments is cooperating with evil, look at what California is doing. Look at what Illinois is doing. Okay, They are helping to bring about the downfall of what we know as the Catholic faith. Please, Joe, tell me where I'm wrong. Um, I don't think you are. That's, <laughs> That's the right answer, Joe, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Father. You know, I, I was thinking about, uh, well, earlier when you were mentioning how people kind of bake themselves in when they uh, choose evil. And that's very true. And obviously there's the there's the theology that discusses this idea that when somebody continues to further themselves down a path of evil, of sin, God will slowly begin to withhold opportunities graces or opportunities for graces because he knows that that person will only continue to reject them so it's a type of mercy in a very weird way when a person continues to go down an evil path and therefore you kind of have this reverse exponential decrease um in a person's um spiritual life and i think that's the that's the um that's what we're seeing with a lot of the hierarchy it's what we're seeing with a lot of the culture and you know if god were to continue offer let's say at the same frequency you know, opportunity for grace opportunity for grace but knowing that every single time that person would reject it well how far worse would their damnation be and um that's a it's a scary thought and of course the bishops are the most important people the most important men in the church when it comes to 
guiding the lady. And yeah, when I was laughing so hard, Father Altman, when you're talking about the nice prayer, because it's true, you know, oh, let's pray for union and that maybe we can uh, all 75 people in my multi-million person diocese, please come do nothing with me because either I personally agree with it myself or I don't really believe in the faith and I don't care um, or I'm a coward. All three of those options aren't acceptable for a successor of the apostles. That's exactly right. And, and uh, so, Father Lovell, uh, you mentioned that the Holy Ghost appointed them, and I guess I'd beg to differ uh, based on what the, and, and the succinct phrasing of Cardinal George uh, when it comes to the Pope. He said, gentlemen, he said this to all the seminarians. There's about 206 of us, I think, at the time. He said, gentlemen, the Holy Spirit does indeed speak at the conclave, but not everybody listens. So we're it's an error for us to think that the Holy Ghost has, in fact, uh, appointed all these people. God has allowed it to happen, but not because that's what uh, would make for a good shepherd. And he, but he's he's not going to come down, and he's good. Otherwise, he'd be the one that he'd just come down and he'd plunk somebody in that place, maybe create them out of nothing, and there you go. Now you have a good shepherd. Um, reminds me of Ezekiel when there were so many bad shepherds, and our Lord said, "I will make, I will make, I will be their shepherd," because right? all the shepherds of that day were just pathetic, feckless losers. So what we have today is a whole bunch of people that were, uh, uh, who attained to that position, not because the Holy Ghost wanted them there because they would lead souls to heaven, but because humanity's free will got in the way of holiness. And then, and then, we, then, they, then they use the word obedience as a cudgel saying, oh, you must obey us because after all, the Holy Ghost, you know, put me in power. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, we must, as Peter made it crystal clear to the hierarchy of his day, uh, no, we must obey God rather than men. And let us be clear. The bishops have disobeyed almighty God. Every damned one of them that locked you out during the COVID lockdown. I don't, what, what, we have amnesia? Do we not understand the infinite disgrace they heaped upon themselves and the and the in the immeasurable destruction they did to the faith when they locked the churches while the liquor stores and planned parenthood and walmart stayed open have we are we that amnesia like have we have we forgotten how they abandoned the sheep that no my friends my dear family these this crop has yet except for the rare exception has yet to apologize to you. And until they do, like St. John the Baptist said to the Sanhedrin, the hierarchy of his day, you, who told you to come? You show some evidence of your repentance. And until they show some evidence of their repentance, you need not obey them. They have disobeyed God. And you don't have to obey a disobedient shepherd. That is foolhardy, foolish nonsense. They disobeyed God. If we're going to talk about obedience, bring it on, bishops. I'm ready. Here we go. Let's talk about obedience, bishops. How you lock the churches. How you abandon the people. How you move priests around. How you destroy the faith of the people. How you've let them go from 100% belief in the real presence down to 20%. Let's talk about obedience, bishop. Bring it up. I'm ready, right here waiting. You see, they have failed you. And you need not be obedient to them and their godless, damned, heretical, apostate agenda. The Holy Spirit isn't inspiring them. Oh, no, no. They have turned their back on the Holy Spirit. Father, I happily stand corrected. Uh, <laughs> you no, know, I just want to say as we have to go to wrap here uh, on this live session that imagine if these bishops open themselves up to the sacraments that they received, not just baptism, confirmation that made them soldiers for Christ, ordination to the minor orders, to diaconate, to the priesthood, and then consecration as bishops. If they open themselves up to those graces, imagine what type of fathers they could be. And so for me, when I say that it's the Holy Ghost that appointed them, it's more the turn that he gave them the opportunity. And you're right. Cardinal George is right. They failed to listen. Dear brothers and sisters, this is Father John Lovell on a special edition of Hope in the Desert. 
We're here with Father James Altman and also my producer, Joe Gallagher. We ask you to like and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube, like and subscribe if you're watching on Rumble or any of the other platforms that we use that have a like or subscribe button. Please do that. We do have our conference coming up in just a few days. For those that are not attending, please keep us in your prayers. June 23rd and 24th in Rosebot. We have a few tickets for holding back. You can still get them at cancelledpriests.org. We'd love to have a full house. We're almost at a full house, and that's great to see. Uh, thank you so much, Father Altman. Thank you so much, Joe. And uh, Father, if you and I could end with both of us blessing everyone, I would really appreciate that. Can Don't I just say one thing? Wait, wait, Go wait, ahead. Wait, Go ahead. I, I'm just stunned by the lineup of speakers at this conference. I mean, I go through it and I just, how did you ever get that many great names under one roof is, is beyond me. Uh, I can't wait to go there myself. So I hope everybody, I mean, we look at the list of speakers. Glory be to God. I'm blessed to be there. Uh, so yeah, anyway. Okay, Father, go ahead. Thank just, you, Father. Dominus Fobiscum. Ecum Spiritu Tuo. Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis Patris. Fidi et Spiritus Sancti. Descendus Super Vos. Maniat Semper. Amen. Amen. Till next time.